<laughs> nice and cozy. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Louis Philippe, uh, but don't worry, I uh, became LP or Professor LP if you want, if you prefer. Um, I will be uh, co teaching, co lecturing this class uh, with, uh, oh, I forgot to plug this. One, two, one, two, test, test. Yes, okay. Just want to be sure we had some fun issues last time. Good, okay, we're all set. So I will be co lecturing this class with Paul Leon. Uh, we're, I'm so happy. In fact, you're, you're lucky because this is uh, his last time doing it with me. He will be graduating this year. Uh, he has been uh, um, uh, remodeling completely this class with me over the last two years. And so I'm really glad he accepted to do it one more time. Um, this course is also taught in the spring. So if you're on the wait list, and I, I will get that answer. Uh, although in theory, only the people who are registered should be in the classroom uh, right now. Oh, here, Paul is in the back. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Um, um, so, um, so, the, um, so if you're on the wait list, uh, we're really hopeful. Usually within a week or two, within the first week, we know how many more spots would be available. We will cap it to 100. Uh, this is the room capacity, and we have some presentations uh, at some point in the midterm, so we need to have room capacity. Um, but there is also the same course taught in the spring by uh, probably Jonathan and Daniel, although I don't know if it has been confirmed. Uh, we also have five TAs, and we select the TAs very carefully because they're very key to this course. Because a big component, as I will discuss later, is a course project, is a big component of this class. And you will work very closely with the TAs and with us uh, on this. So I don't know if any of them are any TAs. Oh, yeah, Sierra is here. Any other? Uh, no, thank you. So uh, we have at least one of the TA here, and you will meet the other ones over the course of the semester. Um, great. So I will do today a split of two things. Uh, we'll uh, discuss multimodal, specifically multimodal machine learning, kind of an overview of this. And I will also after that give a syllabus of the course um, for uh, people also. Um, you should have been all been already uh, registered to Piazza and Canvas for this class. Uh, Those are the two tools we will use primarily for this course. So you're taking a multimodal course. What is multimodal? Do you know? No? OK, bye. That's it. You don't know multimodal? What is multimodal? The, the, simplest, the simplest definition of multimodal you can think of. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So multiple modalities. And in fact, often when you think of modalities, you think of the modalities that are associated with human modalities. So the obvious one, uh, you will have uh, vision, you'll have sound, you'll have touch, uh, and you also have aroma as well, the nose. So all of these modalities are human-based. Over the years now with technology, uh, we look at differently language and the way you speak, the way you uh, express and the intent behind it, the way you say something. So there's often two things there is like the prosody when you say some words, but also the vocal expression like laughter or pause fillers. And then the visual, my gestures, you have the proxemics, the eye gaze, all the facial expression. But these are, again, as we talk a lot, is human-centric. But there's also all those modalities or sensors on cell phone, on different technology that also are multimodal. They bring different modalities, different sources of information. So a modality, at the, the most generic definition of a modality is so it refers to a way in which you either express or perceive. Okay, so it's a source 
you could say the modality is the source, but the modality is almost the, it's not the sensor itself, it's the information, the way, that's the way you perceive, that's the way you are uh, expressing. Uh, there are three seats, so why don't we just do it once? Everybody move towards the center, uh, just so that we have, uh, it's the first class, so we'll give it, um, and yes, I will try to start on time, but let's all move towards the center once. Well, uh, and th this is probably okay, but the, the seats in the center, um, we should expect, expect full house. Um, okay. Meet your neighbors. Okay, it's a good uh, way to stretch at the same time. Okay, thank you all. Um, so that's a modality. And what's interesting with modalities is uh, because often I'm asked, is this a modality or not? And you will often like, like uh, is uh, my emotion labels modalities? Is a GPS of a modality? Uh, is part of speech tags on top of language a modality? And my intuition, my way to see it, our way, is to say that there are some modalities that are more raw, that are closer to the sensor. And there are some modalities that are more processed, that are more abstract. And so these are further from this. So an example of raw modality will be speech signal or an image. But then language is really, I will not call it a raw modality. Language is often a process modality because there was something on paper and you read it. So it's, it's vision that first got the, or you heard it and then from there infer the language, the word, the spoken word, the syllable. So it's still a modality. Uh, but it's a little bit more abstracted. And you can go beyond that and say, hey, my emotion labels, are they a modality? Yes, but they've been most likely abstracted from these more raw modalities. Now, the reason I put things in a spectrum is that the more you are closer to the raw modality, the more relevant to this class you are. And the more you go abstracted, then often these will look a lot more similar, these modalities, maybe in their representation, just being simple zero and one. Or, so here you will often the raw modality be where you really need to think about the issues related to the differences of sources. And I'll give more details about that in a second. Um, and so what is multimodal? So I talk about a modality can be as raw or uh, can be abstracted. So multimodal, the simple uh, definition from the, from the dictionary, multiple modalities. But the, model, the definition we prefer, which I think is a little bit more research oriented, is that multimodal is the scientific study of heterogeneous and interconnected data. Heterogeneous, because modalities are different. If they are homogeneous, then it's more like typical machine learning. But the fact that there's differences between them makes them very interesting. Now, if they're different and they're not connected, then bringing them together will not bring any advantage. So you may as well do it very separately and maybe just uh, mixture of expert on top, which is a very simple late fusion approach, which you could say is still multimodal. By that point, you're really not embracing the heterogeneity and the connection between modalities as much. So I'm going to go and define those terms in more details because these are the core of the course and a lot of the basic concept as we're building uh, for multimodal. And connect interconnected, we use that term because in fact, it is two terms in them, and I will explain them in more, but how connected, how similar, how much shared information. And interacting is when you merge them together, when you fuse them, is there something new coming out of it, some interactions. So heterogeneous is this information present in different modality, 
that will often show diverse qualities and diverse structure and diverse representation. So again, modalities, in this case, when you have two of them, there's a spectrum. Some of them will be very homogeneous and some of them will be very heterogeneous. So homogeneous example, two images from maybe there's even the same camera or two images from two different cameras. Similarity in this case, um, two different languages, and then maybe language and vision that start being even more heterogeneous. So the idea also is that when we talked earlier, abstract modalities will often be more homogeneous and the raw modalities will often be more heterogeneous, different from each other. And I'm gonna give you example of dimensions of heterogeneity. They are not the exhaustive list, list, but it gives you example of how two modalities can be heterogeneous. So just a simple example of language and vision. So how do many people in AI represent images these days, or at least up to a year ago, it changed in the last year, but up to a year ago, how do images are represented? Yeah. So pixel is one representation. What would be the other representations for images? A more abstracted representation of images. But you could go and take the image, go and you get um, a dense representation like an autoencoder. Um, but these days, um, people are looking, they, we kind of talk about the two great extreme, I will say. One uh, like autoencoder and one all the pixel or raw pixel. What is often what people will use as an intermediate between that? So it will be a feature space. So there's different feature space. One will be looking at edges. We'll look at, this is the old school, my days in 2000. We'll look at edges and we'll look at sift features and all this. These days, people will look at images as a list of objects. Uh, so often they will take this, they will run an object detector and each object will have a dense representation associated with it. But really the element, the basic element that often images are uh, uh, processed is not the pixel, although it is a very powerful one. It's often just a list of, a list of objects. The reason I say that, and that's not the only way to represent images, we'll talk more about it next week. But what I want to say is that there is a decision that has to be made of what is an element? What is that unit of analysis? So when you think of multimodal and you think of a new modality, start thinking and like, what would be that like atom, like that basic element that is going to be meaningful, enough information to be meaningful and that there is enough difference between elements, there is this nice, interesting question. And that is a design question you have to ask yourself. So for language, language is created. It's a modality that has been created. So there, the tokenization, that the term we often use, is a lot clearer. Like, what is an element? There's a clear answer. Word could be one. Now, these days, a lot of large language models will go, go sub-word level, uh, talk, calling them tokens. Um, but word is a clear example. Like, it's clear. There's a space, like language. Uh, many languages will have a delimitation. It's not always through a space, but two different uh, techniques. So there, in the one modality, the elements are more objects. The other are more words. So there already you see that there is a difference between modalities. Now, this is only one dimension, which is what is an element in each modality? Another dimension is the distribution, the density of it. Like an image may have many, many objects, or if we had decided that our element is pixels, then the density would have been extremely high. If we use words or subwords, or if we use uh, sentence levels embedding, all of these will dictate also the distribution. 
And then words have structure, part of it may be grammatical, but also in images, objects have relationships with them. If even pixels have relationship with each other. So there's a difference of how the structure is done in each modality. And the amount of information of an element, we talk about a pixel. A pixel gives you some information, but maybe not as much as you would hope. An object, quite a bit. Uh, the same thing for words. Phrases are more informative than words. And then the difference of the noise. And I'm recorded right now, but I will say it. And you can quote me and say, LP said that. Uh, but language is easier as a modality when you think about noise. Okay, <laughs> like, but you can cut this and say, oh, LP think an LP is so easy. Um, but no, uh, what I mean is that there is different challenges in each modality. One of the nice thing of language being also created is that the amount of noise is, is different. There could be typo, especially like if you read um, text messages or things like this, um, but then the, the, the type of noise the distribution of that noise, the representation, the impact on it, all of it is different. On an image, you can have very a lot of noise uh, signals like voice or these uh, people doing brain imaging, very noisy signal. Um, the signal to noise ratio can be sometimes like 20, 30 percent. And finally, how much relevant to the task? Because all of this is finally all of this information, why I have all these modalities, maybe it's just because I'm doing representation learning, but often it's because I have a task, a task because I want to predict, I want to maybe classify regression, or maybe I want to do translation to another modalities, but in other case, relevance to the... Um... So these are six examples showing how uh, modalities can be different, and that really gives an example of the breadth of the differences. But even if you have all these modalities and they are different, if there are no connection or no interconnections, then then it will be um, less useful to do the fusion. And maybe you may end up just doing very late fusion in that case. <laughs> so there are two terms uh, we call interconnection. There's connection and interaction. And I'm going to define both of them. And it will sound simple, but it took us years to understand them ourselves. So it's like, and then once you hear it, you're like, okay, that makes sense. But then this whole thing about interaction and connection is even, or at this time in the last few years for us in my group, we're still defining a lot of these terminology. So connection is the shared information between modalities. And the main idea here is forget that I'm about to fuse that information. Let's say I have language and vision, two modalities. How much is shared between them, independent of the fact that I'm going to fuse it? So the idea is that you have share. So if I say the table, the word table, the visual table, there is part of the information that is completely visual, the texture of it. The, that, that information at least is harder to encode with language, although I could try to say shiny or things like this. The word table also, but it does have, like you know some basic concept about a table. You have decided, we have decided as a society of uh, English speakers that the word table relates to an object on which you can put other objects or usually have four legs or two legs. There's a lot of those concepts that are shared between these two, the object itself and the uh, word. But there's something unique, the way you phrase it in a uh, table. Uh, I, mean, it's, it's, I was gonna say uh, uh, in other languages, but it turned out uh, the only other language I know is French and then it's table, which is exactly the same as table. So it doesn't help for that example. But yeah, the way it's specifically spoken, but the shared information is really important. And uh, just as a preview, CLIP, very famous uh, representation for language and vision, what does it focus on? 
it focuses on mutual information between modalities, which is that shared information. So those representation by design are discarding a little bit of the uniqueness from each modality and really focusing on that shared one. And then you have to ask yourself, like how strong is that connection between modalities? How much there is shared? And the reason things are working so well in language and vision is that there is a very decent, strong share, that connection between these modalities. And the reason why you, it's gonna be maybe a little bit more challenging to take that same technology, that same approach of maybe mutual information and apply it to other modalities, it may or may not have as much shared information. So just be aware that not every modality has as much shared information. And they, right now shared, I, I, I said it in a very abstract way, shared connection. I, I talk about the, the table, but let me be more concrete. There is two ways at least that to connect modalities. There's two ways. One, I will say bottom up and the other one is top down. The bottom up one, I will, we could also call it statistical. And the idea is association, just a fancy word for like co-occurrence. So if every time you hear table, you see that object, whatever that object is, or if I say woof, and every time I say woof, I point at this table, you are eventually maybe doing um, an association or say LP is having trouble today. But yeah, usually you'll have an association uh, with the objects. So co-occurrence or correlation, co-occurrence, correlation, association is a very important concept and mutual information buys a lot on this, that if things co-occur, there must be a shared. And the more they co-occur, the more they share their meaning. That's kind of the basic. The top down is human driven, like knowledge. We establish things. We said it's a table. We established. So we decide, we decided that there is a correspondent. It is a human driven or high level or some knowledge driven that came in and made this decision not just co-occurrence. So maybe it co occur very little, but we establish as a society, as a, as a speaker of a certain language that these will correspond to each other. They will be a, a synonym of each other could be another way to think about it. And there, there's a little bit more interesting is like dependency. It's not just that they co occur at the same time, but maybe there is a temporal contingency. Like when you see that a little bit later, you hear something else, like another event come after another or before, or some kind of not directly simultaneous, but more asynchronous uh, in this case. And the same way for semantic, you will say, it's not just that they're equivalent synonym, but there is a relationship between them. So these are all different ways modalities can be connected, can have shared, information and that's a building block like we're going to spend a quite a few um in fact transformers are often based on that shared aspect as well so a lot of the thing we see when we contextualize things takes advantage of these uh, shared information yes yeah um so in the the association one is the easy one so this one is would be you have a data set with pair data. What I mean by pair data is, is you have data in both modalities uh, where you know that they co-occurred at the same time. The samples from that image and that caption, they co-occur or they're related. So, and from that, uh, computing the association will be done with um, simple correlation or co-occurrence or mutual information as I described. The correspondence is often, if you do it bottom up, then you will infer that when there is association, there is correspondence. But usually here, you will have knowledge. You have a knowledge base that gives you that correspondence, that information. 
Now, maybe you get it because you have a language model that can tell you some information about the link of that. You can discover it from knowledge. Um, so as I said, I mean, I put them as separate, but really what they are, they're, they're more that way. So you could go bottom up to try to find correspondence. So you will say correlation and co-occurrence is hypothetically a way for me to identify correspondence. Or I could go top down and say, I'm given from human, from data, that correspondence. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, you, but I will still call it a bottom up in that case, uh, because you're really looking at co occurrence of tokens uh, as a way to, but if you come and you have supervision in your model, uh, and you add supervision to your model. Now, if it's just a label, but if that label says father or happy, and then you're starting to add this a kind of more top-down information as well. But yeah, as you see the statistic, then you could interpret the middle layer, but as Um, at some point, the problem of these is that you don't have human interpretable representation at upper stage. You could say that semantic information is probably there, but until you have some human interpretable representation, it's a little bit hard to make that claim. But yeah, and it, it, it is expected that transformers will learn something more and more semantic or more and more structured as you go uh, upper level, yeah. But at this stage, what I wanted, and, and we have quite a few lectures on this, so I, it's still a little bit abstract. But uh, at this level, what I want to say is that modalities, when you think of them, there is, if, even language and vision, you could think of it bottom up learning and representation, or you could have knowledge and then add that knowledge to, uh, to do, uh, identify those correspondence. Most of them here will be uh, ob ob observational, so like latent. So you will, um, so you will up, if your question is like, you have uh, like the temporal one will be, um, the easy one will be sequence of, ob uh, of word or sequence of frame. That's, that was your question? Yeah, 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 yeah. The, um, um, Okay, uh, let me describe the interactions uh, soon. Right now, for this, I do not, I've not yet talked about any modeling, and that's maybe the confusion. At this stage, it's just the data has that temporal. Uh, how I'm going to model it is, is something we'll discuss in a second, but just the data has that temporal, and yes, you will want a model to do, or you may want to just do data analysis and just find what those temporal ones. So if you're just doing modeling, then just doing the latent. But if you do data analysis, you will want to do it in a way that's human interpretable because you will want to learn that the, the, the temporality, yes. Okay, let me go for the interaction um, so that you also understand the other aspect. So one is the modalities themselves. You have the modalities, they exist. Um, but then you are eventually doing a fusion, an inference, and that's that's um, that's a little bit uh, the, uh, the I think the confusion is the connection exists. There's the data. There is it. It has co-occurrence. It has connection. Now I'm going to learn some model to either learn a representation or maybe I'm learning a label or I'm learning another modality. And it's only at that stage that I will not only maybe discover these connections, but there's something more that's gonna happen, which is interaction. There, the modalities will come together and they will start creating something new that neither modalities had by itself. And that's where the interaction, where the process, where modality can affect each other, creating a new response. That's the interaction. So you can have two modalities, 
that are completely shared. Their meanings are completely shared. But then when you learn a model together, there's not much interaction because the information in one modality is completely redundant from the other modalities. And then you fuse them and there's just no interaction. While you could have, in fact, completely different modality that do not share anything, but have great interaction. Because if you think about it, interaction is probably more likely when there's less sharing because there's more diversity. There's something in one modality that the other can bring. And when you bring these two pieces of information together, they're really bringing something new. Now it's never completely one and completely the other, but that is a basic building block of connection or shared information and interaction. And that's one of my main goals for today at the high level, and we'll discuss more over the weeks. But the idea of inference is that you are learning a new representation or a new prediction. And this one, with this, when you do this modeling, this inference, this training, this is when the interaction will come. And what's really interesting is that people 20 years ago studied interaction with human and animals. And they suggested a taxonomy. And the taxonomy is quite useful. It's a little bit simplistic, but it's very useful. So the way they started, they said, hey, I have two modalities for human and animals. And my first level of taxonomy, I will say, are they redundant or not? Do they have shared information or not? And they simplified it because they made it completely redundant, completely sharing, and completely non-redundant. And then they went ahead and said, if they're redundant, then there's two things. One where it's equivalent, that's the thing where there's no interaction, it's just completely equivalent, or there's still an interaction in a sense, they're enhancement, they're kind of adding to each other. You could say almost additive in the sense, in a simple sense. There, yeah, if they are non-redundant, there's no shared information, then they said, there could be that they're just independent. There's no interaction in this case. So there, no sharing, no interaction. But sometimes there's one modality that may take completely over the other. That the dominance happens quite often. If you're not careful in multimodal learning, one modality has a little bit more signal maybe for your task, takes over, the other modality has a lot of trouble, maybe because it needs a slower learning rate uh, or something like this, and, and, and the other modality takes over. We'll discuss these issues. This, this starts being interesting. Modulation is interesting. One modality changes another modality. There's a transfer, there's a modulation, there's a change and an effect. And the holy grail, the emergence. Something comes out of uh, neither modalities knew before, and you put them together and something comes out. So that's the other great. Doesn't happen often, but when it happens, it's fun. Yeah, I mean, the uh, classic one is, I don't have the video, it's a fa, 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 no, you didn't see that, oh, okay. The McGurk, uh, McGurk effect, um, so, uh, Pa and ba, I think the pa and ba, I think these are the two vowels, um, are exactly the same audio. Um, so if you close your eyes and uh, pa, ba, no, no, that's it, no, it's not pa and I forgot which one, but there's two vowels and a mega effect. And, and it's really interesting because if you just hear the audio, close your eyes, you hear exactly the same. But if you see the lips, then it is cleanly, directly a different vowel that you hear. That's like, and that's why it's really interesting the history of uh, 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 speech recognition, or at least audiovisual speech recognition, because speech recognition had plateaued in 70s, 80s, uh, had plateaued. And, um, and then they were like, oh, the reason a speech recognition doesn't work is because we didn't think of visual, using visual. It turned out that the Megurk effect is only like one, two percent of 
recognizing like it doesn't happen so often so it, it didn't solve a speech recognition but it got us a lot of funding in the multimodal so that's cool. uh, and and if you think about it um the audiovisual doesn't always need to be for emergence because in the case of now i don't know for you when i moved to us the first time i was looking at the lips a lot for redundancy yeah uh, it, it's like you you use both signal uh it's redundant it's robustness you increase robustness by having multiple modalities so it's not always about emergence but when it happens it's really cool yeah good question okay so um the multimodal i, I know it's a lot of information at the high level and you're like okay but how, how because he didn't use the word transformer yet and we're in multimodal what is that like come on ai i uh, saw it open ai did it um so heterogeneous interconnected that's really the core of it i will the second part of the three part of the lecture today uh is i want to know multimodal machine learning just one question is there any difference between machine learning and ai who, which one is a subset of the other? Or are they equal? Okay, good. Yeah, good. Good. <laughs> good. You're at CMU? Good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So machine learning is the study, and this is uh, a computer algorithm that improved through the experience of data from multiple modality. Machine learning is a lot about generalization between modalities. Then there's multimodal AI, multimodal artificial intelligence. And there, the AI is a more global about a computer agent to demonstrate intelligence capability, such as understanding, reasoning, planning. So planning, you would say it, it's related to machine learning, but it's, it's a different uh, subfield, uh, uh, very important in robotics, for example. So uh, AI will be a bigger, but in the press, you see machine learning and AI often as almost the same. Um, so if, if I by mistake use AI instead of machine learning, but there here we're we're not going to go all the way to the AI creating a full agent and all this. We'll talk a little bit about that, but this is not the full focus of today. We're we're focusing on the machine learning and the multimodal is that instead of repeating, I, there's no point in us repeating the core machine learning. We're trying to focus on what is in multimodal that's understudied in typical machine learning. It doesn't mean that it's not studied in machine learning, but it's maybe understudied and there's something about multimodal that really emphasize. And it's usually more about something related to heterogeneity and connection between modalities. So multimodal AI is a superset of multimodal machine learning. So at the high level, multimodal is this idea of, I will often, in fact, the whole lecture, all 14 weeks, we started using with Paul this uh, representation of modalities. So we'll use modalities. We could have it like this, but we'll do it this way, just to emphasize. So a uh, rectangle, uh, uh, square, and circle, just to show there's heterogeneity between modalities. And so multimodal machine learning, is about maybe fusion, about representation. So maybe you're trying to learn a new representation, a prediction, or maybe you're even pre trying to uh, predict a new modality like translation. The course itself doesn't make a huge differentiation between unsupervised, self-supervised reinforcement learning, because these, are, in a sense, are very core, a very interesting topic in machine learning. The main differences for multimodal often come in other dimensions of learning, and we'll emphasize those. But there, there is a relationship. We'll talk about self-supervised, but the, what makes multimodal multimodal is not that it's self-supervised or unsupervised or, or other like supervised. Like this is less the issue. The main thing is what is different. And so... We've asked this question uh, about like, what is different? Like, uh, and, and you know, after a while, and when I started multimodal the, in my days, um, there were only two things, uh, early fusion and late fusion. So 
you do melt tomorrow. Oh, okay. Did you try early fusion or late? Oh, you tried early. Yeah, you should try it late. Yeah. Uh, right. and, and like, oh, late fusion. Oh, good. And then someone came hybrid and they did both at the same time. That was a big novelty. So, but that's like, but now melt tomorrow a lot more. And so the question is, what is uh, bring our core challenges in months model? So uh, 2014, uh, we started uh, uh, a first survey paper to try to define a taxonomy of multimodal machine learning. It came with the first course at CMU on this topic um, and tutorials. And most recently, uh, with Paul and Amir, um, we did a new version of that. That would be your first reading assignment. Luckily, we're splitting it in four, so you don't have to read uh, all 20 pages. Uh, we're trying uh, to make it. Uh, but yeah, so 20, this is the latest, and that's what the course is based on, that uh, recent uh, survey papers, uh, paper. And um, as a quick note, uh, there is a public website of the course uh, and we will have a public website of this course also um, but things on that public website will be updated slower so for you as a student don't look at that one very much uh, you're, you're welcome to look at last year or take at it but Piazza is the place where we'll have fast pace the latest lectures and all this part of the reason is uh, we have to edit every lectures before we put them on YouTube. I, I, I don't want, I cannot, and I don't want uh, any of the voice of the students there. So we edit uh, this. There's, if someone happened to walk in front of the video. So there's a lot of this we need to do editing. So the version that goes on YouTube uh, will be a version that is edited uh, on that. So doesn't mean you should not ask questions. It's okay. We can mute this. It's not a problem. But we just... If you don't see your question in the YouTube version, don't be angry. It's not that LP didn't like your question. It's just uh, there's really well-established rule and we wanna be careful with that. So um, so don't, this is a public version. And the reason we do it is because we want to share this uh, outside CMU. And that's the reason we have the public one. So there are six challenges we identify and that's what the course is gonna be built on is on those six challenges. And I'm going to give a high level of those six, and then we'll talk about the syllabus after that. The first one is, is the most uh, obvious one. It's, it's representation. It's, 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 it's uh, the main, um, when you think of deep learning, like neural network, one of the main motivation behind deep learning was representation learning. In fact, yes, again, in my days, you wonder where is LP's days that he keeps talking about. But a lot of it was feature engineering. There is a lot of well-taught feature engineering. I talk about SIFT feature that are visual in language. There was very, a lot of interesting knowledge on how to engineer good features. What really changed with deep learning is, is that these are automatically learned data-driven feature representation. But then you ask yourself, how do I learn representation that reflects the connection and the interaction? That is the main issue. And when we started start deciding the taxonomy is like representation learning is such an important aspect, we split it in two. We said, let's have local representation learning and then more global contextualized representation learning. So local is that you have two modality, maybe a caption and an image. And now I'm gonna take one element from each modality, like an object and a word, okay? Simplify, and the reason we decided to simplify is a lot of the core building block, mutual information, all of these are easier to explain and uh, one element on each modality. Let's not think that the word was part of a sentence, that the object was part of an image with a lot. Let's forget about this for a second and let's just think about that local representation. You could say the other way. You could say, in fact, it's a holistic. It's a representation that is the whole, all of language uh, of that sentence and all of the object in that, that could be another way. 
uh, to see it. I prefer to think of it as local, uh, like you take one word. And, and that's what we're going to be in the first few lectures, just really understanding the core building blocks of multimodal that way. And when you think of multimodal representation, oh, yeah. Yeah, so um, for the for the purpose of the first two or three uh, week three lectures, the lectures in week three, uh, we will suppose that if you have democracy and an image, we're going to think of the image as a whole. Um, we will not try to think of the image as having subparts in it. We'll say an image maybe has been approximated by maybe a dense representation, a natural encoder or something like this. And, and the word has been encoded in a certain way, but they, there will not be uh, an understanding that within the image there are subparts to it. We'll ignore that for a second. Uh, that's kind of what I mean is like, either you do it in the image and think of it holistically, or you think of a subpart, an element, and that's the only the element that you fuse. But for week three, that's what we'll do. And then week four and five, we're going to suddenly say elements uh, have a structure to it. Uh, the simplest one will be a sequence. And we'll talk about transformers and all of this at that point. That's the kind of building on that. Yeah, good question. OK, yeah. Okay, great. No, these are great questions. I will say two things. Um, first of all, this distinction of local and holistic or local and structure is very pedagogical in nature. It is As a professor, it's easier for us to learn these basic concepts of local before you get in more complex. The reason for that is I don't want to go right away to tell you about a transformer and clip and all this and say there's a library use it and be done with it is like i really what we want to build those at the end of the day most problems are structured so but the really interesting thing is now you will have new tools to improve those transformer to emphasize maybe different aspect of the fusion you're interested so um, so at the end of the day, in, in practice, you most of often going to use the techniques that have structure in it, because most problem has structure in it almost, but the pedagogically, it makes sense to explain that. And there are problems you can solve this way. We'll discuss some of them, um, but often most problem will have a structure to it. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's a pedagogical tool also. That's also how we thought when we did the survey was like, how do we teach a researcher, young researcher or new researchers in multimodal? That was really the key of that. So then there is, if you think of, okay, I have two elements, very simple. But then there is three, at least sub challenges. There's fusion, there is coordination or there fusion. Fusion means that the number of input modalities is larger than the number of representation. The classic, you have two input and you have one representation. You're uh, jointly fusing these modalities. You get a joint representation. Coordination, so this was the most popular up to like three, four years ago. Now these days, this is very popular. Coordination a very big building block of transformers because what does transformer do is contextualize nodes with each other. Like it, it's a big contextualization machine. You could say coordination machine, these transformer. And fusion, we could also call it factorization. Your factorizing is like you're going, expanding the number of representation is larger. And usually this is used often when you're also trying to do uh, understanding uh, of the data. So if your goal is to do analysis and understanding, what are those interactions happening? Because there may be this, in this case, you're putting everything together. The most obvious of the fission is the one I talked earlier, where you may create three of them, one that is unique to this modality, one that is unique to this modality, 
and one that is shared between the two modalities. That would be the, the, the classic factorization, uh, the multi-factorization, multimodal factorization you could do. There are more, uh, but that is a classic example. So that's the first one. Very important. We spend at least one full week, uh, one week and a half on that. And then, oh, yeah. <laughs> You said two objects. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, yes, yeah. Um, um, so okay, these uh, I say they're visually represented. My modalities for all of our lecture, like triangle, and but this is um, this is a data set, and you could have put an accolade. This is a data set of words, and I have pair data for now. What it means is in my data set of words, I have a second data set of images. And for each word, there's a pairing. Now, for that, I know that this word relates to that object. And that's, that's what I mean by here, <laughs> sorry for that, is that I have that um, pair data. So here, what I'm learning is what is unique to words in general? not to that triangle. It's like to all of these words, to all of those triangles. And what is unique to all of these images and what is shared between images and that, yeah. So yeah, I, I know they were both visual, but uh, it's just because the decision we made early on to all our lectures to have it uh, visually, all of uh, modalities, but here, the one modality, they're not both, um, they're not, this is not two objects of the same modality. Yeah, sorry for the confusion. Then the second one is alignment. This is the idea that modalities have structure. There is a structure, there is a sequence, there is, in fact, images have like objects that are structurally related to each other. Uh, it could be hierarchical. So there, the alignment is twofold. One is to learn what are the relationship between the elements. What's the relationship between the words? What's the relationship between the object? But the real goal is to learn a representation that take into consideration this alignment, this grounding. Now these days, people call grounding almost anything that links something to each other, that alignment, that grounding that you have. So when you think of alignment, there's two alignment specific challenge. The first one is learning those alignment, this connection. Oh, oh, that's the old oh, taxonomy. I didn't update my slide on that one. Okay, ah, oh, sorry. Okay, um, I will come back on that, but okay, forget that. Um, I will update that slide. Uh, we updated it for the ICML. A tutorial, but I forgot to update that. Um, there is two alignments. So the goal of alignment is the goal of grounding. I have all of these uh, words, I have all of these objects, and I want to know which words are related to which object. And there's one type of alignment, one type of grounding, which we'll call discrete grounding. Discrete grounding. What it means is my image has already been discretized into a list of objects. So I already have discrete tokens in one modality. I have these list of elements in one modality, and I have that discrete list of token and element in the other. And we love those discrete grounding and alignment because language models are so cool these days. Everything is a word. Everything is a token. So we love to take something that's maybe not a token, not a discrete thing, and force it in discrete. So there is that. But then there is continuous alignment, where I don't force the image to be just a list of uh, token. I don't force the signal of speech signal to be maybe discrete syllables or discrete like uh, audio frame, like you will let it more rough and force, allow the more continuous alignment. So discrete alignment and continuous alignment. And then take this knowledge about how 
modalities are connected to each other, how modalities are aligned, and then learn a representation that is structured. You know, like what's the number one example? Transformer. These days, transformers allow to learn that connection, that alignment, but it does it in a very extreme way where it says everything is connected with everything. And let's be very data driven and learn it, all of these. But you can think of other ways of learning it in a more human interpretable way as well. So I will replace that. Uh, the third one is reasoning. That is the really uh, cool one. And let me define it the way we believe uh, in this course. Reasoning is the idea of looking at multiple steps, inferential step, multiple inferential steps. And you could say, hey, my deep learning or transformer has multiple layers. So it must have inference and the higher level is more, as we talked earlier, more semantic. For the purpose of this course, we'll say that reasoning is when those intermediate stages are more human interpretable. And that human interpretability could be very simple. It could be just attention weight, but you can start now these days where intermediate representation are words like Socratic uh, models, where all intermediate representation are words. So for us reasoning, if you are reasoning and everything is latent and non-human interpretable, it is kind of a reasoning, but it, it's it's a very, yeah, it's a non-human interpretable. So then a lot of the typical reasoning, causal inference and all this will be a lot harder to do at that stage. So, um, so this is reasoning at a high level and the reasoning sometimes also have external knowledge to it. The last three, so the, if you ask me the main three, are these three plus a quantification, but there's also two more uh, that comes with this, which is generation, where in this case, I'm generating one modality. And I could be generating one modality because I'm translating or summarizing or creating. And you're like, but they're all generating another modality. But the idea is how much of the information you want to keep in the other modality. In, bless you. In, in typical translation, you want to keep all the information, like you translate from one language to another, you want to keep as much of the original information in the translation in the next target modalities. But in summarization, that's not the case. You want to maybe reduce, and creation is probably the holy grail in the sense of creating because it it doesn't have as much constraint. You're creating more information. And that's, I say holy grail, it, it's definitely a lot more research to be done because there's a lot less constraint about it. There is transference, which is, uh, it was called modulation for the human version of this. For the transference, you transfer knowledge from one modality to another. And now these days, uh, it's funny because back in the days, uh, 10 years ago, when uh, the uh, CNN, uh, Convolution Neural Network, came in, um, then we were starting to transfer computer vision knowledge to uh, NLP. There was quite a few paper going that way. Now, these days, large language models have a lot of knowledge, so we transfer it the other way. Uh, so. But yeah, where one modality, usually transfer happens because one modality has less knowledge or less data than the other. Uh, and transference is about bringing this uh, enhanced information to do. And so you can transfer and there's also co-learning. So transfer in this case is that at, at test time, you will have a certain modality and then transfer comes from another complete different modality. And you can do it in two different ways. One is through representation or generation. This one is interesting. It's like, it, it's, it's by generating the other modality, you're learning 
uh, extra information for that first modality. So let's say I want to do language representation. I want to do language representation, but I also have the nonverbal. I could say, hey, I'm going to lose my, I'm going to learn my language representation in such a way that I'm still able to predict the nonverbal facial expression that happen or co occur at the same time. And so, but at test time, I will only have language. I'm doing it just to help and transferring. This is a small building block. When you think of fusion, there's definitely that transfer of information that happened between modality. But here in this case, we're studying it in a directional way. And that's kind of a building block. Of a... And finally, the quantification where our goal is really to understand. It's not just better accuracy, it's understanding what is multimodal, how does the multimodal happen, how is there heterogeneity, what is heterogeneity, what is the interaction, and how do you do optimization? So these are the six main challenges that you will have uh, for this class, is representation and alignment. These are the core building blocks Almost every problem uh, will have. And the reasoning is always there. It's just sometimes it's a little bit more shallow. Sometimes it's deeper. And sometimes it's more human interpretable. Sometimes it's less. And there you may be just predicting a label or generating another modality or just transferring information. And quantification is a more holistic view of all of this. So that's what we'll talk about in this, in fact, uh, this is the uh, lectures. We may tweak here and there the lectures, but this week, uh, and I will talk more about this lecture on uh, uh, Thursday, um, this is introduction uh, week. The week two is we do unimodal. Um, I don't have the time to do all modalities, so there's a big focus on language and vision, but I will also discuss other modalities. Uh, as well. And then multimodal, we could have uh, called it a uh, local representation. That's week three. And then we will discuss alignment by itself. And then this one is, is just uh, mostly a transformer. Just I, we, I really want you to understand transformer without those um, um, typical uh, and non-interpretable way of presenting uh, transformers. I'm trying my best to present transformer in a different view so that you have a different intuition of transformer because they are a key part of many. Uh, so we're presenting a transformer and then we'll discuss multimodal transformers, multimodal representation structure, and then reasoning, grounding, the project hour may be replaced with a tutorial that day by the TAs. Um, we're discussing with the TAs about that. Um, and then we will talk about reasoning, different aspects of reasoning, generation. Um, there's a democracy day on November uh, 8th, I think. Uh, so there's no class. This is going to be interesting. This is, this is fun for me. This is, uh, uh, this is the one time where you're all here. Uh, uh, we'll talk about uh, in-person attendance in a second. But the project presentation is is the midterm. This is like, you've already started thinking about your project. It's a short presentation, five minutes, but it's really fun to see all of these uh, presentations. These are oral presentations. Then we do transference, quantification. We do, this one is nice. We take all the recent papers uh, of that year, uh, of the last six months, and try to uh, do a lecture about some of the cool things that we've seen. Uh, and usually we end up integrating that the next semester. So we're helping each other in each semester to make the course as latest as possible. That's one of the things. I mean, we also update all those lectures every week, but this is also us putting. Uh, Thanksgiving, well, no classes. And then uh, also because I really, we really want you to focus on your course project uh, the first week of the first part of Thanksgiving week. Um, and then guest lectures will uh, give you them. We're finalizing them. And then this is a poster presentation of the project. This is the, the final one.
So the last uh, 15, 20 minutes, what I want to discuss is the course syllabus. Um, and this course, uh, there may be some undergrad student in the class or also some master. Like this course is very uh, project oriented. And uh, there are four project assignments, but uh, most of your grades, and you really need to put energy on those. And so it's different from other courses that may have like weekly homeworks and uh, a lot of those weekly homework and, and, and uh, very detailed. Uh, there, it's a little bit more open-ended. This is your research. This is your ideas and I really want. And instead of having our homeworks on data set that we process and and you tr and then we tell you to take that data set, do a bunch of things, you, but you don't care about this data, and then get the result just for the homework. We designed this course so that all of those uh, homeworks that you will usually have in a class are all done on your data set that you care about as a team. Okay. Oh, by the way, there's no team of one. There's no team of two. I know really well what happened with the team of one. It's like, oh, I'm already working on some multimodal. I'm going to squeeze in that multimodal project I'm already doing for blah, blah, blah. And I just put it there. So we found that team of three and four are optimal for this class because we really want you to explore something that you don't do. Or even if you do multimodal in your research, we, you are allowed it, with the team to work on something similar or related to your research. Um, but and most projects should be on something that's not your day-to-day -day research. It's something outside. And that's why the teams are important. The other reason for teams is that with 100 students, uh, if we have 100 reports, uh, I would need a lot more TAs. Uh, and so uh, we really, we care a lot. Those four deadlines for the project uh, are very well thought and we work really well with the TAs to help you on this. So. So the course paradigm uh, is uh, um, Paul and I giving lectures. Um, and we, we thought a lot about how do we get sure that people uh, either attend the lecture or watch the lecture without annoying you. The, the, the second part is important too, like annoyment is not fun. So, um, and we found an interesting way, the student seems to love it from year to year. So I'm discussing that, but you get 16% on watching the lecture and taking notes. When you listen uh, a lecture, you should be taking notes. If you're not taking notes, you should take notes at lectures, okay? <laughs> you're like, oh, I remember everything, I don't care. Yeah, so there, you get 16 points to do something you should be doing anyway, which is taking notes. I will tell you the format of it in a second. We call them highlight forms. Um, you get 12 points, 12% 12 for reading assignments. We were careful. We usually, we had 10 or 11 or 12 reading assignments. We reduce it to six because we don't want a reading assignment when you have a project assignment and or project presentation. So we reduce that. And then the course project is the big part. It's split into four. In fact, if you, to be exact, it's, it's six assignments, uh, but uh, two, um, two of them are double um, because there's a report and a presentation. So I will give you more details in a second. Um, so if you're here and you're still here on Thursday, it's because you at least accepted those three things. You should be ready to read six papers. Come on, six papers. Okay, but read them, please. You've already taken some machine learning. I will not teach you PyTorch. Uh, I, if, if you've never touched PyTorch, um, or done any deep learning or basic machine learning, and you should have done that. Um, uh, so that's basic machine learning should be there. But as you mentioned, as we mentioned, here's multimodal. So we're trying to look at what is not in typical machine learning. So we go beyond and very motivated for high quality paper because we designed the course so that you could probably your course, your final project will be close to a paper submission to a conference or close to it. Not exactly, but close to that. Um, the main, main difference between the final project 
and the um, the uh, our paper is that even if you have negative results, you get a hundred percent in this class. Negative result because this is research. I can't expect that in three months or two months you will um, you will have positive result ready for publication. But I can expect that if you have negative result, you know why. Okay. So I, I don't mind negative results. This is, I mean, this is research. This is like, this is the thing that you have most of the time is negative results. So, but as long as you know why the analysis of it is important. So uh, the course project is, you will select a data set with at least two modalities. We, um, we suggest, but not force to have at least language and vision for most of your data sets. It's not a requirement, um, but it is a suggestion. Um, we will have a pre-proposal that will help in case you want to go in a different direction. Um, the reason we do that is often a lot of our concept, I decided to use these two modalities as two building blocks for the class because a lot of papers around that and they do share a lot these modalities. So. Teams of three, four, and five. We may do exception for six uh, students, but it's uh, and and so and the paper will allow you. So here's the the project timeline: is that you first have a pre-proposal. That's a big, and that's a reason also uh, we really need like all of these adding like wait lists and all this need to be done relatively quickly. So if you have to drop the class, drop it soon. Uh, <laughs> okay, this is a horrible class. Like, get out of okay. But yeah, uh, no, but it, this, uh, if you were to do it, just be nice uh, because we really try to go a very quick turnaround with the wait list because we really want to do the team. By September 13, you have your team and you have an idea of which data set you use. That's all we ask you. By the first project assignment, you've done a first literature review. You should do a literature review before you start doing any machine learning, AI, and PyTorch. The second thing, you should look at your data before you start doing training and all this. Data tells a lot, and take a time to do data analysis. Unimodal, some of it multimodal, will tell you a little bit more about it. Midterm, this is the moment where you ran some of the state of the art. And then at that point for the state of the art models, you are uh, showing what is not working. You're learning from their mistakes. And then finally the final project. So each, TA, each team will have a TA and is your primary TA and you will meet regularly with them. At the minimum, you will meet four times, hopefully more. And this is the list in the short term. That's your homeworks in the short term. On Thursday, Paul will give a lecture on, uh, in general, research methodology, but also give you example of data sets. By Tuesday, this Tuesday after Labor Day, uh, we want to know your project preference. And for that, it's to help you find a team. This is for team. This is our team building exercise. Uh, on Thursday that week, we will reserve some time for team building. If you already have a team, you can end 15 minutes early. And then that time, you have a team. No excuse. No, no. If really it happened, it does happen sometime you don't have, it's okay. Just share with us a project, a pre-proposal, and we will help you find a team. But please do as much effort as you can to do that. I just want to show uh, one thing, two things uh, left, two, only two things. The highlight form starting next week is this form of you taking notes anyway of the class. So, and the idea is the following, is that the class is split, split in three segments. I will have my alarm. And the idea is after 30 minutes, you have to write two bullet points, two sentences of, what you've learned during that first 30 minutes, what you've learned in the second 30 minutes, and what you've learned in the last 20 minutes. 
And then you also have, well, what have you learned for the whole sentence, the whole lecture? We also have a section uh, optional for questions. So often people are a little bit either shy or there's not time or realize there's a question later. So this is the time for asking question and we will reply to that uh, in a, usually a post within a day or two. Now you were question like, oh, can I do remote? You can, there's no Zoom link. We will post a, a recording in the afternoon, but you still have to do this by midnight. Okay, so you may as well wake up in the morning and come in or do it later in the day, but you're doing it the same day of, okay? The thing is to keep a rhythm, yeah. So travel is okay. Um, you should let us know in advance. Uh, most travel are in time zones that are compatible with this. If you're really traveling in a place that's like 12 hours difference, let us know. We can give you a little bit, but it definitely needs to be done while you travel. So plan ahead with that. If you have for some reason, like there's always emergency and all this, there's flexibility. In fact, um, there is, uh, I don't have a there. You have a six, you have late days. You also have six late, late days uh, that are personal. And um, I'm just maybe gonna let Paul maybe tell uh, on, uh, on Thursday the details, but the reading assignment, the details for that, we will post that soon. But the reading assignment will, the main idea for that, if you don't mind for one minute, is the reading assignment is with the discussion. I love discussion between students, but a hundred doesn't work. So we're gonna split you in, in subgroup and you will discuss papers. And the idea is, uh, I really make, I try to make it good for all of you, is that you read one paper for, you, for the price of four. So you read one, you make a summary of it for the other people who've not read it in your group, okay? So you get the summary of the other three papers for the price of writing one paper. And you ask each other questions if you don't understand the summaries that, of the other papers. That's the basic idea of that. Okay, we'll give a little bit more details on this. The information is online, but thank you all.